This is Newsroom on SABC News. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg in South Africa. My name is Evan Yanthan. The show is broadcast live every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. Highlights are repeated at 2 in the afternoon with a whole rebroadcast at 5 a.m. the following morning. We're also streaming live on YouTube between 9 and 10 a.m. every day with the entire show then available on our YouTube channel. Now, Oscar Pistorius is not expected on the stand when his murder trial resumes in Pretoria this morning. Shrin Devani arrives tomorrow with a renewed focus on the South African justice system and Zuel and Zima Vavi has confirmed that he'll be back at work a little bit later today. But first, here are the news headlines. A medical expert is likely to be the first defence witness when the Oscar Pistorius trial resumes today. Pathologist Jan Boerta is expected to challenge crucial aspects of Riva Stenkamp's post-mortem findings. Pistorius faces a murder charge for shooting and killing Stenkamp on Valentine's Day last year. Honeymoon murder accused Shireen Devani is expected to fly out under escort from Britain this evening and arrive in South Africa tomorrow morning. He's being extradited from the United Kingdom to be charged with the murder of his wife Annie in 2010 in Kailicha outside Cape Town. However, Devani will have to undergo a psychiatric assessment in South Africa to determine if he's fit to stand trial. Three South Africans have already been convicted of her murder. Nine Kasatu affiliate unions will gather at Kasatu House in Johannesburg today to welcome newly reinstated Secretary General Zuelan Zima Barbi back to work. Barbi has confirmed that he will be back at his desk after the High Court in Johannesburg set aside his suspension on Friday. Barbi was put on special leave in August last year pending the outcome of a disciplinary hearing relating to his affair with a junior employee. Now, Paralympian and Olympian. Olympic athlete Oscar Pistorius' defence team is expected to kick off its case today after a recess of 15 days and explain why Pistorius shot his girlfriend Riva Stenkamp four times through a locked toilet door on Valentine's Day last year. Let's cross to our reporter Chrysalda Lewis outside the North Gauteng High Court. Good morning, Chrysalda. Very good morning to you, Eben. Oscar not expected to be on the stand right up front, so I reckon then today's big question will be whether Riva Steenkamp had a meal at around midnight on that fateful day. Well, certainly, Yeben, well, uh, Professor Jan Buerta, a pathologist, will be first uh, to take the stand uh, this morning. We're expecting him really to delve into the post-mortem that was conducted on Riva Stienkamp. You would recall that one of the state witnesses, uh, a pathologist, Gert Seyman, had given details and concluded that uh, Riva Stienkamp had had a meal two hours before she was shot and killed. So really, uh, we were expecting to get the opinion of uh, uh, this uh, uh, Jan Buerta uh, to give his aspects on what he thinks um, uh, could have happened uh, exactly when Oscar Pistorius and Riva Stienkamp ate, what did they have um, for supper, and also uh, uh, crucial aspects of the shots as well that were fired, um, from which direction which they were fired. Uh, so really, uh, Jan Buerta will uh, testify to those crucial aspects here today before we understand Oscar Pistorius will take the stand. Chrysalda, it's been quite a long break uh, in the middle of what's been a very intense court battle. Uh, how has this break uh, affected the case? Well, I wouldn't really say affected the case, but it most certainly has given the defence enough time to prepare Oscar Pistorius. Recall it was widely anticipated that Pistorius will take the stand uh, last week already, but one of the assessors fell ill and, uh, of course, court had to adjourn. So really giving the defence more time to prepare Oscar Pistorius when he does take the stand, he will have to relive what really happened, uh, according to his version, what happened on that morning of Valentine's Day. We're also expecting him really to be very emotional once he does that. We've already seen him break down several times uh, over the past couple of weeks or so. Uh, really, that's when Oscar Pistorius will have to stick uh, really very uh, 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 crucially 
to what he initially said, that he thought that Riva Steenkamp was an intruder on that morning. That's when he shot and killed her, thinking somebody else was behind that door. So really, we're not expecting Oscar Pistorius to say anything different uh, to what he's been maintaining, because that's really what uh, the prosecution will really look for during cross-examination, when they would want to try and nail Oscar Pistorius and try and find loopholes in the version that he has uh, given thus far. Griselda, at first glance there behind you, it looks a little bit more quiet than normal. Uh, uh, is there a little bit less scrutiny uh, from the media, especially international media, on this case now? Well, when Oscar Pastorius arrived here just behind me, say about 20 minutes ago, uh, there, was, there was really quite a, a, a media scrum to get uh, pictures of Oscar Pastorius, as we all anticipate that after uh, the, uh, Jan Buerta, the pathologist, uh, takes the stand, Oscar Pastorius will then follow. But uh, you would also recall that there are two stories that are really dominating in South Africa at the moment. It's, of course, the Oscar Pastorius murder trial, and you know, Shreen Dewani, one of the big cases as well in Cape Town, that a lot of the local and international national media are focusing on. So really split between the two, uh, given that Oscar Pistorius uh, might uh, uh, testify today and also, of course, the arrival of Shreen Dewani and what's expected uh, to take place mm. in that case as well. Of course, dominating headlines here and abroad. The, the, uh, the case will now proceed with forensic evidence, I suppose, and, and, and everybody then expects Oscar to take to the stand sometime later in the week. Would that be accurate? Well, if we're lucky, Yerban, we're expecting Oscar Pistorius to take the stand uh, today. Uh, after, uh, we're not sure how much time uh, Jan Buerta will be on the stand for. It really depends on the cross-examination. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, when he states his case, he'll be cross-examined on that. So, uh, really, uh, how long that takes uh, yeah. uh, will really give us an indication of when Oscar Pistorius will take the stand. So, we're really hoping that's going to be uh, towards uh, this morning or a little bit later on this afternoon or maybe even tomorrow morning, but we're definitely expecting him to be the second person to take the stand. And, and Oscar really has to take the stand when gets a feeling that the defence sort of hedging their bets on this. And, and then how long do we expect him to be on the stand if he does uh, take to the stand today? Uh, is it going to be extended about a week or what's the sort of thinking? Well, the last communication that we had was that the case will go on until the 16th of May. But, of course, yes, once Oscar Pistorius does take the stand, we're not expecting uh, Harry Nell, the state prosecutor. We're really expecting him to take his time with Oscar Pistorius under cross-examination, trying to find loopholes in uh, uh, the affidavit that Oscar Pistorius uh, gave uh, in terms of his version of events of what happened on that morning. So, um, as it stands, it's still the 16th of May, but we're not expecting Oscar Pistorius to get off the stand. Stand. He'll probably be on the stand for about a week or so, uh, and then uh, perhaps we'll be able to proceed yeah. with the rest of the case. But uh, we're sure Harry now will take his time with Oscar. Thank you very much, uh, Criselda Lewis. Yes, I'm sure Harry now will take his time with Oscar Pistorius in the world are waiting and will be watching when that happens. Now, Oscar Pistorius defense team confirmed that uh, the Paralympian will take to the stand in his murder trial. Chris Alder thinks it might even be today. The defense team will try to show that Pistorius acted in uh, private defense when he shot Riva Stenkamp in his Pretoria East home last year. Now, uh, in our Pretoria studio to talk about the defense's preparations and what they would focus on, we are joined by Marius Dutoy from Dutoy Attorneys. Good morning, uh, Marius. Thank you for joining us. Morning, Evan. Thanks for having me. Let's start at the beginning. Everyone's waiting for Oscar to take to the stand. It's really something that has to happen, and in a way, it's central to his defense in this case, one would think. Absolutely, Evan. One must understand that uh, Oscar's version that he has tendered via the plea and the, the bail application statement is not considered evidence in his favor until such time as it's repeated under oath. So he has to go into the witness dock, he has to open himself up to cross-examination for that evidence to be tested. If he doesn't go and test it, then the exculpatory statements that he has made will not be taken into consideration. And then the court will be left with only the state's version of the events. And uh, today, forensics expected to be the order of the day, uh, I think, the key question probably, 
did Reva Stenkamp have a meal at around midnight on that fateful night? How do you go and prove or disprove that she did or did not eat at that time if you were on the defense team? Well, I think one would have to look at the food itself, Eben. I think one would expect the doctor to be able to say that the state of digestion of the food was such that you can put a time to it. Just like pathologists are able to guesstimate the time of the death of the deceased when you, when you find a body uh, hours after the deceased was killed, the same, I think, would apply to the food. Because the moment the person dies, the, the stomach stops to digest the food. But I think it goes one step further, of course, Eben. I believe that the defense needs to put evidence on record to show that when the fatal wound to the head was sustained by Riva Steenkamp, mm. that at that stage she was not able to, that she was able to, according to the state, sorry, she was able to scream. But they will, of course, try and show that she wasn't able to scream and try and refute the evidence of the neighbors that she screamed at the night. The world waits for Oscar to take to the stand, and I'm sure right in the front of the queue would be Harry Nell, and uh, I'm sure Harry Nell would be putting Oscar through his paces, as it were. How long do you think Oscar will be on the stand, and how would you prepare to face the kind of hostile reception that I think he would get from Harry Nell? Well, what you can do as an attorney is you, you let your, sta- your client read his statement, the statement that he made to you when he consulted with you. You'd give him that statement to go through it. Obviously, you can't coach your witness. You can't say to him, this is how you should answer this, and this is how you should answer that. But one can expect that they would have taken him through his paces, and he would be well prepared for the evidence. He would also be prepared to understand what sort of questions he would be asked. And, of course, there will be some hostility. It's quite clear that Harry Nell will try and expose his version as not being probably true. He'll try and expose the improbabilities contained in his statement and the inconsistencies with the evidence that's been attended already. Yeah. And by that, they'll try and refute his version. And all they have to do at the end of the day is to try and show to the court that Oscar's version is not a reasonable, possibly a reality, and hence refute it. Now, it is uh, kind of weighty, this evidence in this case, say, uh, people outside of the case. What do you say? How much weight will his performance on the stand have in this case? I think it will carry much weight, Yevon. I believe that, uh, you know, there's only two people that know what happened that night, and he is one of them. Uh, the other person is unable to testify. So I think his evidence is going to be crucial. Of course, his evidence must be corroborated by his own experts. And we all know that there's going to be a number of experts. There's yeah. going to be acoustic experts. There's going to be pathologists, forensics. So there's a number of experts they're going to adduce in order to confirm his version. But understand that his version only has to be reasonably possibly true. The state has got everything to do from the outset of a trial. They bear the onus uh, to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So the scales are always tipped yeah. in the accused's favor. Oscar himself, uh, uh, it's probably difficult for you to, to put yourself in that position, but what do you think he believes he has to prove on the stand uh, personally to the world uh, in this case? I, I think, Eben, that, uh, that he's going to do his best to try and show that he's a person that made the biggest mistake of his life, that this was a complete error in, ju- uh, error in his judgment, that he thought this was a burglar, uh, and I think he's going to do everything to come across as convincing as possibly with regard to that version. And, of course, Harry Nell will do his best to try and uh, negate whatever he tries to portray himself uh, as during the incident. Maurice, you mentioned some of the uh, other witnesses that will be called. How long do you expect this uh, defense part of the case to continue? And what kind of witnesses do you expect uh, them to call? I believe, Eben, that uh, this matter is going to carry on for quite a while still. Um, I think that, uh, that, that Barry Rue and his team would call acoustic experts. They will call their own ballistic experts. We saw him sitting behind uh, Barry Rue in court the whole time. Yeah. I saw a forensic expert that was there in court as well. Um, and then over and above that, they, they've had the opportunity after the last uh, adjournment, they had the opportunity to consult with, with state witnesses that have not been called by the state. Because remember, the moment the state closes its case... All the witnesses they have not called now becomes defense witnesses in the sense that the defense now has an opportunity to consult with those witnesses should they wish. And should they wish to call them, they can do so. So I'm quite sure that we will have a lot of forensic evidence. We'll have a lot the pathologists, of course. We'll have the ballistics. And, of course, we might even have further eyewitnesses or, or witnesses that testify about the circumstantial events of that night. Marius, thank you very much for a unique insight there this morning into how the defense will present its case when Oscar's trial resumes.
uh, this morning. And of course, just to recap, a medical expert is likely to be the first defense witness when Oscar Pastores uh, takes, uh, well, when his trial resumes today. Pathologist Jan Buerta is expected to challenge crucial aspects of Riza Riva Stenkamp's post mortem findings. Pastores faces a murder charge for shooting and killing Stenkamp on Valentine's Day last year. Supposedly D Day for Oscar Pistorius. But the defense plans to bring a motion which will delay Pistorius' testimony. Its expected Professor Puerta will take the stand. Personal reasons have been cited for Puerta taking the stand ahead of Pistorius. The NPA says it will not oppose the motion. Puerta is expected to challenge state forensic pathologist Professor Ger Seyman's testimony. Seymans has told the court that Stenkamp ate her last meal about two hours before her death. It also emerged during the post-mortem that Stenkamp had an empty bladder. The state says Stenkamp could have emptied her bladder an hour before her death. But the defense will argue she had gone to the toilet to relieve herself. They've got to get around the food in the stomach, which Gert Simon says was there for two hours or less. That would again fly in the face of Oscar Pistorius's evidence that they were fast asleep in bed at 10 o'clock that night, which is some four or five hours before. The state believes Pistorius killed Stenkamp in cold blood. The courts heard testimony of an argument, screams and gunshots at Pistorius's home on Valentine's Day morning. But Pistorius insists he accidentally shot the model after mistaking her for an intruder. A question which was raised by the bail magistrate was why did the accused not uh, first check that the noise he heard was Ms. Steenkamp and why did he leap to the conclusion that it was an intruder? And so that would be a question which the court would like to hear an answer to, in my view. The defence has already conceded it has no choice but to call Pistorius to the stand. Meanwhile, honeymoon murder accused, friend Devani is expected to fly out under escort from Britain this evening and arrive in South Africa tomorrow morning. He's being extradited from the United Kingdom to be charged with the murder of his wife, Annie, in 2010 in Kailicha outside of Cape Town. However, Devani will have to undergo a psychiatric assessment here in South Africa to determine if he's fit to stand trial. Three South Africans have already been convicted of a murder. Devani lost a three-year battle against extradition when the British High Court dismissed his appeal last month. After a long and protracted legal battle, Sri Dewani is now hours from being scheduled to take a flight to South Africa. He is set to return to Cape Town, the city where his wife Annie was murdered in 2010 after the taxi the newlyweds were travelling in was hijacked. Mr Dewani stands accused of arranging her killing, an accusation he has always denied. Mr Dewani's lawyers were looking to halt his extradition on medical grounds. And experts from both his defence and the South African prosecution agree he has been suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. He is due to appear in the West Cape High Court. The 33-year-old will continue to receive medical treatment at the Falkenberg Psychiatric Hospital. If he is not fit to stand trial within 18 months, he will be returned back to the UK, as agreed by the South African and the British authorities. Departure to South Africa could bring Annie's family a step closer to finding out the truth surrounding her murder. Natalie Fury, SABC News, London. Well, let's take a quick look at what you are talking about on social media at the moment, of course. The Oscars trial resumes this morning, and I'm sure a lot of traffic will be directed at that. Uh, Layla, our first tweet, Layla says, Let's do this. Hashtag Oscar Pistorius Oscar trial. Of course, that's where you can send your comments at SABC Newsroom on Twitter. Tiffany Markham says, Delighted that doctor's orders of bed rest coincide neatly with Oscar's testimony. Woohoo, I think that sounds a little bit planned, uh, actually. Yolandi Muller says, Today Oscar Pistorius takes a stand. This is going to be very interesting indeed. I could not agree with you more. Sir Ductive says, what an interesting defence this will be. How ready is Oscar Pistorius? I think Oscar is as prepared as he can be. Jackie Khadebe, one thing I'm waiting to see is Oscar taking the stand, though it's more useless that he's not to be televised while testifying. Well, that remains to be seen. I tell you, uh, whether it's on camera or not, it will be live all over. 
and you'll be able to follow it. But let's have a look at what's happening on our Facebook page. Uh, big stories uh, we'll be keeping an eye on this week. There you'll find the latest on the Oscar Pistorius trial, of course, as well as the latest on Shreen Devani. And Nigeria is almost certain to push ahead of South Africa to become South Africa's biggest or oh, Africa's biggest economy. We've got all of the details on that story on our page, of course, for those of you that uh, follow the royals. Britain's royal baby, Prince George, made his first overseas trip to New Zealand yesterday. Go have a look at the cute pictures on our Facebook page. Then, on a lighter note now, here at Newsroom, we know all too well that live TV is not a walk in the park and that you're often juggling with one hand tied somewhere behind your back. We'll take a look at some of our overseas colleagues and the news bloopers of this year so far that have landed on YouTube. It's not an easy job, this. Good afternoon from the 7 Newsroom, I'm Jacqueline Felgate. We have not gotten into the worst part of this storm yet. That is to come a little bit later on tonight. So uh, obviously uh, here at the College of Charleston, they're uh, already having a good time. I compare winter to be the Justin Bieber of seasons. It was kind of cute and exciting when it first started out, and now it's a bit obnoxious and should probably just stay in Canada. Not really more accumulating snow, but just... Yeah, not an easy job. Tough job sometimes. What we're going to take... A short commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we have a constitutional expert that's going to tell us about the focus that will be on South Africa with these two court cases, Shrindavani and then, of course, Oscar, that we start shortly. This is Newsroom on SABC News. Africans understand the importance of saving, whether it's money, the environment, or electricity. That's why in just five years, half a million solar water heaters have been installed on rooftops across South Africa. Now millions of people can enjoy hot water whenever they turn on the tap. And it's environmentally friendly too. No other country in the world can match us in this amazing rollout of solar geysers. It's all part of the National Infrastructure Plan. Together, we are changing lives. The international advocacy group Human Rights Watch says millions of people in Harare in Zimbabwe remain at risk of waterborne diseases as a result of contaminated water and poor sanitation. She says, our children think it's a stream and play near the sewage, pushing each other into it. People use this water to water their crops, but when they're truly desperate and there's no water from city council, they turn to these shallow wells for their household use. That's Primetime News daily at 6 p.m. on SABC News. A narrow focus will this week be on South Africa as two high-profile murder trials will be held in South Africa's courts. So the trials have, been, well, have attracted both media and international attention. International legal expert from the University of South Africa, Professor Shadrach Guto, says South Africa's judicial system faces intense scrutiny in light of these two cases now. In a matter we've just handled in our newsroom program, Paralympic medalist Oscar Pistorius is back in court for the murder of his girlfriend, Riva Stenkamp. British national Srindavani is on his way to South Africa or leaves this evening to stand trial for allegedly orchestrating the murder of his wife, Annie, uh, in November of 2010. Devani will sleep in a single occupancy room at his request, according to the report here in South Africa. Now, Professor Guto joins us in the studio here this morning. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you very much. Interesting week ahead of us, I would think. Uh, why do you say the South African legal system is facing this kind of intense scrutiny? Well, I mean, um, given that these two cases um, are of uh, international interest, particularly the Oscar Pretorius one, because he was an icon um, and, and 
from that point of view, we have seen how the media even requested to really run the whole trial um, live. Of course, the judge did limit a bit yeah. on how that is to be done, but uh, the media is camped at the high court in Pretoria. And uh, from that point of view, um, it is not just the person who is uh, the case itself, the person trial, but um, the court is yeah. open to the public now internationally. And that uh, really brings a lot of um, uh, uh, responsibility on the part of the court to be able to acquit itself well, yeah. to do the work well so that... Um, uh, our judicial system yeah, is then projected as one that is credible, efficient, yeah. able to do its work well, um, irrespective of what the outcome of the cases may be. Yeah. But I think that is what is important, but also because we follow a system which is adversarial. Not all courts in the world do some. Some are inquisitorial. In other words, the yeah. judge takes part in the actual investigation yeah. of, of a case. Uh, in ours, the judge is more sitting to listen to the two yeah. sides, and it is vigorous um, uh, battle between the prosecution and the defense. Yeah. And th that makes it very interesting interesting to others, but also educative yeah. to, the, to the public. And the Diwani one is going to be equally interesting, not at the same scale as that of Oscar Pretorius, but nonetheless, we are watching the yeah. space. I want to talk about uh, the Diwani scenario mm -hmm. and, and go back to before the case even started. How do you think South African authorities have acquitted themselves in the extradition case or in the extradition of Shundavani until now? I think that um, it is important. The crime was committed in South Africa within our jurisdiction, as we say. And from that point of view, it is a question of are we able to deal with the crimes that are committed within our territory? And obviously we had, if the investigators um, and, and uh, were certain that they have a good case. And yeah. indeed, um, it was not only Diwani who was uh, on trial for the murder of Diwani's uh, newly uh, wed wife. There are three people already in prison. The person who claims to have been um, asked to look for the you know the, the killers yeah. uh, he, he is in jail the two who actually carried out the murder are in jail the question now is was their testimony that they were simply hired uh, by the one yeah. really true it is going to be very intriguing in, indeed but what did you make of the long period of time that it took to get him here four years almost it, it is about two years, and uh, obviously um, when he went back to uh, Britain, he did indicate, or rather it was alleged that he was ill. Uh, he had a trauma um, uh, arising from the death of his wife, uh, according to him. And so he had a psychological problem, but also a trauma, yeah. which are serious. Under those conditions, you can't really testify properly in a court of law. But South Africa insisted on saying he should come. South Africa has uh, sufficient facilities to yeah. be able, medical facilities, to be able to take care of his health while he goes under trial so that we get to the bottom of the truth. The truth will emerge uh, to, uh, only after he has been tried yeah. properly. Yeah. Well, what, what about things, Professor, like uh, special treatment? Uh, he, Trindavani doesn't want to share a room with anybody, for instance. Uh, is this special treatment and, and does this open a can of worms? Well, it is not uh, unusual that there are some um, uh, prisoners that is awaiting trial yeah. prisoners or people who are going under trial who may have special conditions, um, health conditions, and are kept in separate um, 
uh, places of custody where they can be looked um, uh, after by those who are dealing with the health matters. Yeah. So from that point of view, it is not an isolated case, but um, it does indicate that that service is there. Yeah. So for South Africans or anyone who really finds themselves in such a situation, they should be able to ask for similar treatment so that this is not a special treatment yeah. because it's British. I think that that is important. Um, some of these cases help the public also to know they have a right yeah. should they find themselves in those situations. But already the fact that the British courts really did accept that it should be extradited after long appeals and so on. Yeah. It means that the uh, the courts in in the Britain have confidence uh, about the courts in South Africa. Yeah. That's something good for the country. That, that is very very good. Confidence yeah. always good for the country. Thank you yeah. for joining us uh, today, Professor Shadrach Guter from the University of South Africa. Thank you once again. Thank you. The South Khatian High Court has set aside the suspension of Kosatu General Secretary Zwelenzima Vavi by Judge Phineas Moyapelo. The judge said the Congress of South African Trade Union Central Committee Executive had the right to suspend Vavi but found that it had failed to comply with the Trade Union Federation's constitution. Kosatu did not put the matter to vote as prescribed by the constitution. Judge Moyapelo ordered Kosatu to pay the costs. In August last year, Kosatu said Vavi had been put on special leave pending the outcome of a disciplinary hearing relating to his affair with a junior employee. Daniel Silke joins us from Cape Town to give us the implication of the decision of the court. Good morning uh, to you, Mr. Silke. Thank you for joining us. Yes, good. Good to be with you. Your views on how matters will proceed from here on in, sir. Well, I must say, I think that uh, there has been what I regard as uh, certainly for the moment a breakdown in confidence between the two factions really within Kasatu. And this particular judgment, whilst it, of course, restores or vindicates, in a sense, the factions that have been supporting Zwell and Zima Vavi, it also continues to make life very difficult for Mr. Vavi within the broader Kasatu movement. He will return to his work today, as I understand it, but he has to face, of course, internal opposition from some of the anti-Vavi factions within Kasatu. At the same time, over the course of the last number of months, the way the matter has been dealt with by Kasatu internally, and in fact the judgment, also vindicates the pro-Vavi faction. So the warring factions look as though they are set to continue their conflict within Kasatu, and indeed the implications, broadly speaking, for South African politics is that the trade union movement is simply no longer a cohesive force. It is now personality and faction. It has fa personality and factional differences, and increasingly, I think it will also have ideological differences with the main body of the ANC as we move into the post-2014 period. How is this going to play up in the run-up to the election within four weeks from now? Well, look, we've already seen that the pro-Vavi factions, in particular NUMSA, have uh, de-linked themselves from their official support for the ANC. Some of their members, no doubt, will continue to support the ANC in the election should they, don't find, if, should they not find any other political party that's attractive to them. But I don't think it's going to have a dramatic effect uh, in the next month. I think the more interesting effect will come over the course of the next few months after the election. Uh, if NUMSA can get its act together to uh, start and establish another political party that uh, really takes into account the interests of workers, as it suggests it, it will then I think that this decision now and the entire episode surrounding Zwell and Zima's Vavi's leadership is going to come to the fore in the next two years. Uh, a new political entity that perhaps is to the left of the current ANC could be established, and we'll wait to see what Mr. Vavi's role would be in that particular new entity. Vavi yeah. himself retains, I think, a substantial following. I think he's a charismatic individual. He's incurred the wrath, certainly, of the ANC, and particularly the Zuma faction within the ANC, by yeah. being particularly critical of Jacob Zuma, uh, by being critical about aspects of ANC policy, especially dealing with labor, and also about issues surrounding the uh, 
implementation of toll roads in Gauteng. And I think these issues are going to feed into a new political discourse in South Africa in the next few years in which labor on the left of the political equation become a lot more important in putting their case on the yeah. national agenda, not necessarily from within the ANC, but for the first time, I think, from outside of the ANC in a new political movement. Finally, do you see this special Congress that's being called for as the catalyst to sort of kick all of this off in the days and weeks to come? Well, this is where the battle is going to be. Uh, clearly, the NUMSA faction perhaps want to steer Kasatu to its view of the world, to its more pro-workerist view of the world. It obviously regards the ANC as leaving Labour behind. The rest of the Labour unions who continue, broadly speaking, to support the uh, ANC alliance, who are, broadly speaking, anti varbi will obviously want to keep control of the alliance and keep it, uh, of Kasatu and keep it within the fold. Yeah. And I think the battle royal will be at that national conference, if indeed it can be held, and there will be probably be a legal challenge uh, from the NUMSA faction yeah. to try and get that Congress held. That could be the battle royal, I suppose, about the future of Kasatu within the alliance, or in fact the cohesion itself of the labor union movement. And I think the uh, anti-Vavi movement, in other words, the pro-Kasatu movement, will do their level best to try and avoid that national conference yeah. taking place in the near future. Daniel Sulker, thank you for joining us from Cape Town. Uh, give us, uh, well, the implementation, implement, well, <laughs> the implication of uh, having Zuelin Zima Vavi back at work for the labor movement here in South Africa. Thank you for joining us. Well, the court is underway uh, in Pretoria, the North Gauteng High Court, that is, uh, when, where Oscar Pistorius' trial resumes this morning. Let's go directly to the courthouse. Just, just to summarize your curriculum vitae, uh, what are your qualifications? A lady, I have an MBCHP from the University of Cape Town. And when did you obtain that? Uh, 1969.